Hey everybody, welcome to our relay intercropping webinar. Um, got everyone's filtering in here now. So Scott and Kevin, if you guys want to take your camera off, you can uh, you can probably leave yourself muted. I'm going to chat for a while here. Um, thanks for everybody for coming on. Uh, Trav's got the presentation rolling here. I'm going to start how we always do. Uh, questions in the Q&A box. Dan Fox, a regular on our podcast, raised his hand, which he knows is a no-no. So no Dan Fox <laughs> questions tonight. Thank you very much. Making a mockery of the Q&A section. Uh, yeah, so uh, Q&A, we've got uh, time for about, uh, the guys are going to go for 10, 15 minutes each. I'm going to ask questions as always. And then uh, we've got some really great questions for the guys. We're going to try and address some in the presentation but lots of good questions coming in from the registration sign up. And again, the Q and A box, uh, best question. We're going to send a covers and co hat to, uh, so just make sure when I say, uh, you won the covers and co hat, just put your mailing address in the box, please. And thank you farm. We want to promote this week is farm tour from John and Henry. Uh, what was it last Friday or last Thursday, a morning meeting that, uh, turned into afternoon beers. So it was a lot of fun. Got to tour, uh, the dairy, 850 cow outdoor um, dairy production, and they were uh, had a barn full of pigs that were drinking milk byproducts. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really cool day. So we wanted to show it out. They got a, a direct marketing going on. Um, so yeah, contact Henry on social media, or you guys can Google them. They're, uh, they got some cool stuff on the internet. So without further ado, I don't think I missed anything. We can uh, get rolling in the presentation, Trav. So just to touch on the, to the real basics of relay intercropping. So of course on top, we have a monocrop, that's an oak plant, grows, dies. Um, we move on to the next year. In a relay scenario, we're, we're incorporating a slower establishing crop at seeding time or interseeding uh, species into the already established crop. And the idea is we're just capturing wasted sunlight. It's chilling below the canopy. Um, developing a root system. And then when our cash crop comes off, uh, uh, the relay crop has the chance to capture the later fall sunlight and it has the advantage over say a fall seeded cover crop where it had you know summer rain and could capture some sunlight underneath the cash crop to establish a root system. And that's why it's called a relay. So we're not starting from scratch and fall with the fall seeded. Um, it, we've already got a head start. So. We're just going to touch on and we're going to talk about lots about implementation and seeding tonight. Uh, the, the, the three most common methods and those are one sown, uh, you know, a slower set establishing say legume. So maybe a clover is very common, alfalfa, vetch, we're going to touch on. Sown it with the cereal, the cereal establishes and then the, the relay just kind of hangs out down below. And uh, once the cash crop is off, that's it's kind of its chance to thrive and photosynthesize. Uh, the second one is uh, maybe less common, but a better chance of success than maybe number three is going in with a disc drill after herbicide. So usually pretty early because we want to get a crop established before the cash crop chokes out the sunlight canopy. So going with the disc drill where it's minimal disturbance, we can get that seed placed in an ideal conditions to give it a jump kind of on the, on the cash crop and get it established beforehand. So in three is broadcasting. So there's lots of options. There's an airplane, there's a spreaders, there's uh, Valmars on Harrow bars. But the idea is you can cover a lot of acres in a short amount of time, kind of uh, match the, the seeding, seed timing with uh, moisture because we're not getting that seed to soil contact. So the idea is get it down, get a rain on it. And so it can establish itself before that cash crop closes off the canopy. So that's kind of a, a pretty generic start into, into relay cropping. Hopefully that just gives you kind of an idea of the concept that we're, we're trying to achieve. We got, these guys are, have, have uh, both tried lots and lots of different types, methods, you name it, varying successes. And yeah, we're gonna talk lots about it. So Scott, if you wanna unmute yourself and I'm not sure if, you're, if your camera's on, but Scott, why don't you tell us about your farm? We're gonna talk about relay cropping. You've watched these a few times. I'll butt in with, with questions. So uh, take it away. Um, Alrighty, here I am. Show it beauty. I, 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 sorry, Scott, I meant to say beforehand, this was this segment's brought to you by ExploreNet. 
which is responsible for my terrible internet. So if you don't like the quality of the delay, please call ExploreNet and let them know how happy we are with the, the internet service provided in rural Manitoba. Whoa, Take it away, Scott. Whoa, 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 what was that? I can't hear you there for a minute. Oh, oh. I, that's, so, that's so ironic. I was complaining about the internet. No, you're just all right here. I, uh, yeah, I think that's that's a problem that is going to plague rural Canada for a while yet until Elon Musk gets us all dialed in. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that's just the way it's, it is. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Scott Beaton. As Joe said, uh, I farm uh, near Rosser. I kind of split the farm between Rosser area and just north of Stonewall. Um, and uh, I'm a first generation farmer. And so take everything that I say with a grain of salt because there's, there's obviously something wrong with my head if I <laughs> decided to do this to myself. Um, I farm a section now. Uh, I work off farm as well for a conservation group doing uh, wetland restoration type work and, and wildlife type stuff. Um, but the farm's been keeping me pretty busy here the last few years. Um, I'll get you to bump up to the next slide there, Joe. Thank you. Um, so I got a similar picture to what Joe said, and I take a pretty similar view, I guess, of how we might define relay cropping. I, uh, yeah, I guess as you as we go here, you'll see where I think we can we can make it work. Um, this picture on the top left comes from the uh, Natural Systems Agriculture website, um, and they kind of define it as making something fit into a winter cereal. Uh, and I think that's a really good way to to get started in it. I think it's a place that makes lots of sense. And if you go to Eastern Canada, Southern Ontario. Um, the consensus is almost that it's a no-brainer to put red clover in under winter wheat and that's a big part of the rotation and they seem to have it figured out pretty well and it's relatively dependable. Um, I think Scott, I'm going to interrupt you and uh, probably keep chatting because I don't know how bad this delay is but yeah. why don't you talk what's what's going on in that picture picture there? Um, yes so on the top right there uh, that was the first green manure crop I ever grew. So that was 2012. I've been uh, playing around with kind of extending the, the growing season for four or five years before that and trying to put a crop in after uh, winter wheat or a early cereal harvest. And this was the first year I dedicated a whole year to growing that crop. And so it's a uh, uh, fava bean, pea, soybean, oats, uh, the white flowers, there's some radishes that are going to seed. Um, and I worked it under and then came back a few days later and seeded in a kind of catch crop mop up, trying to deal with some of this nitrogen that I just worked under. I think knowing what I know now, I that was probably a mistake to work it under this early. I, I think I'd been better served to let it keep going and get a little more carbon in that system so that I didn't just mash this uh, this green nitrogen rich, uh, this mat of stuff into the ground. There's a guy, uh, Gary Zimmer, that uh, is pretty interesting to listen to and he kind of correlates what you would feed to a cow. Think about that when you're thinking about how fast some of this stuff is, is getting digested in your soil and I, that works for me. May not for everybody, but yeah, I just think Scott, was, I, I, I apologize about the damn delay. Uh, Gary Zimmer was the one that gave me my aha moment on carbon to nitrogen. I mean, it would made so much sense uh, having a history feeding cows, knowing, you know, what is too rich, you know, what's crap and what's a nice balance and making uh, carbon to nitrogen, making it as simple as reverting it back to what we feed a cow and what's ideal for, for that. 
and what we're feeding the soil, that it's actually the same thing. It just, it clicked ever since then it clicked for me and I'm able to put that into perspective. So I'm, I'm glad, even though we're talking about relay cropping and, and now we, we've tangented off into green manure, that's an excellent segue, my friend, and I thank you. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I made it to the second slide before I went off on the tangent. But yeah, I guess <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good way to think about it. If you put that in a cow, she'd blast it out the back pretty quickly. So you need a little more fiber and, and we can wait in that scenario. And, and I think it might serve us better. So here's, I don't use the aha moment uh, line very often, but I guess this is probably a good place for it. Uh, in 2015, so a couple of years after that first picture, uh, I seeded a pea, uh, or sorry, an oat fava bean crop uh, that you see in the top right picture there. And uh, I came in at, I was the day of this picture. You can see my tracks going across the screen there and put in some, uh, some red clover. And sorry, I said ryegrass in the text, but that's wrong. There was no ryegrass there. Um, so that was in uh, the date here. It was, yeah, there, Herod in the Clover on May the 25th. So I see this the end of April, went back the end of May. And by the third week in July, I'm mowing it down with a flail mower there. And then the regrowth that came back is that bottom picture on August 27th. So it was just phenomenal. We had good moisture that year. Um, there wasn't a whole pile of clover when I was mowing it, but the, uh, the oats and the clover came back quite vigorously and uh, just a pile of material uh, and really nice stuff. Uh, this went into organic corn the following year. I should have said in the beginning, my the whole farm's organic now. The uh, the first picture there was a kind of transition year for me. And since we've been transitioning the, the rest of the land and uh, three years ago was the first year that it was all all through transition. So but maybe just talk for a, a second on, like you gave us a pretty good idea with that picture, but as far as timing with seeding the red clover and you said you heralded it in, but just kind of what conditions were like as far as seed to soil contact on that, on the clover. Yeah. So uh, I just spread it on that yellow thing on the front of the tractor. There's uh, uh, just a little spin spreader and it works quite well for stuff like clover. I can dial it up to about 55 feet and I've got a 50 foot harrow bar that I do all my kind of organic weeding with. It's a tine harrow, they call it. Um, so lots of harrows, uh, they're an inch spacing in between them and uh, five or 10 ranks deep. So it gets pretty good coverage, moves lots of soil around. Uh, it's definitely not as good as Joe said in the beginning there. Uh, if you can put seed in the ground and pack it nicely, I think that's what you want to do. Uh, but this seems to work not too, too badly if you can get a little bit of moisture. Um, so it was dry when we went into that, but we got a little bit of moisture and it came along um, and yeah, ultimately did fairly well. Here's a picture of that rig there. Um, so this was the year after that in 2016, uh, I'd seeded some fall rye in the fall prior and put on some uh, red and alcite clover uh, and it did quite well again. And that was seeding time in the top left there. So no leaves on the trees like here. It's you got to get out there pretty early if you want to see uh, some clover get established before that rye kind of takes over and canopies over. Um, well, Scott, this I sorry, man. I the delay here is terrible. I apologize, but uh, you're, right. you're you're going into rye here. Um, you were talking about going into oats earlier. Talk about mm -hmm. maybe the disturbance or the damage on that like that cereal when you go in with a harrow bar and like, do you think it compromises say the yield or growth on that, on the cereal crop with the harrow bar? Uh, no, I think at this stage, I don't think I'm hurting anything at all. I do. Uh, I see it a little bit on the heavy side if I know I'm going to do this. Um, and I probably expect to take out 10% uh, of the plants at the, at the worst and Maybe in that previous picture, the oats would have been about two leaf or so. And so I could see losing maybe 10%, but 
this rye that's getting to be fairly advanced i don't think you heard it really at all it uh it bends over and it looks nice like you went over a baseball field after it's after it's done but it uh it doesn't really in a couple of days you can never tell what you did i think there's probably an argument running the hair over at that stage is it actually maybe even makes the plant tiller better as well yeah, that's what the guy that sells you that fancy arrow bar will tell you. I don't know whether it's true or not, but yeah. Um, Maybe we heard from the same guy. <laughs> exactly. So then this is the same year as that uh, that spring seeded uh, clover in a full rye. So we got lots of moisture. Uh, this is at the land in Rosser, which is a little bit heavier than where that other stuff was. And uh, so that was, we got three good, good things. And it's time to hear sometime where it didn't work. Um, this was sweet clover. I put in just through the mineral banders uh, when I was seeding hemp and we waited and waited. So June the 11th, we ended up seeding uh, three pounds of clover is all I put down thinking you know, there's a chance that this might get a little bit carried away. Sweet clover can get tall, but um i hear guys doing it all the time in in cereals and oats in particular lots of guys seem to do that and and have good luck so i figured i'd give it a go um it ended up that picture on the left is combining and i was ready to throw in the towel and the neighbor convinced me to go out and give it a try and it actually went through the combine somehow i don't still don't know how that worked to this day um but yeah it, it yielded uh, I think it was 300 pounds once it was all clean and 300 pounds of organic hemp nothing to shake a stick at so it wasn't a complete failure I don't think but it sure you wondered what you were doing when I was going around and around on that field and then the picture on the right is the following spring so that was the the regrowth that came back it was nice and uniform uh and I was trying to kill it in this picture and I was completely unsuccessful. I went and seeded, I think the day after this and it bit me again the following year. So that was, uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a tough one to me. I think, I don't think there's a problem with, with seeding it at the same time as a cereal, but uh, I think I would go out and do exactly the same thing again. Uh, but just 2016 was a real wet year where we are. And so, the hemp didn't love it and clover really did. Um, the one thing I do wonder is hemp's a warm season crop. And I wonder if I didn't wait long enough uh, and give it that kind of competitive advantage. Like by the third week or fourth week in June, that hemp can be grown seven to 10 centimeters in a day fairly easily. And, uh, I think if it if it were at that stage, nothing and nothing can keep up. And I've seen it time and time again. When you're looking at weeds in a hemp crop, they just they if that hemp can get ahead of them, they never ever can. All the, the buckwheat hangs on for dear life, and that's about it. So um, that's maybe the one lesson is to to think about that: Are you putting it in a cool season or a warm season? And if you are looking at a warm season crop, you got to make sure you give that warm season enough time to, to get going. Um, so if you're looking at putting something in soybeans or, or something to that effect, then let that soybean get established before you think about putting some el something else in is, is my thought there. And I, I hope somebody listening is going to tell me I'm wrong. Cause that's uh, that's a good, I, uh, I got, I got a couple real sad uh, <laughs> relay stories where the relay crop turned into, took over the cash crop quite unfortunately as well right on but it's all in the, it's all in the fun of it if it was easy everyone would do it scott that's right that's right so yeah <laughs> don't don't get disheartened on your first uh first failure i would have quit it quit everything a long time ago i mean everyone um, worries about the relay crop taking over but the by far the the the, the worst case is nothing grows at all yeah exactly <laughs> So it's oh. more it's more art than science. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this last series of pictures that I wanted to show, uh, this was 2019. 
uh, we were, excuse me, going into a little bit drier time. Um, and I had underseeded some clover alfalfa Timothy uh, underneath some uh, that was mustard and yellow peas. Um, and the mustard and yellow peas were to be harvested as grain. And so we went in, they were just kind of starting to poke through and uh, broadcast them with a Valmar and uh, put them, just kind of scratched them in really lightly uh, and got a little bit of rain after. So everything got germinated it up and uh, did quite well. Like it, it really looked, you look at that canopy that was that uh, pea and mustard and it was thick, like there was not a lot of light getting through there. Um, and so the fall picture there with the, the middle one and the truck in it, uh, that was September of that same year. And it looked not bad. Like you almost thought uh, it's going to be a little bit patchy. And uh, the last picture that was August 25th, which I don't really love making a second cut on August 25th, but I knew I was going to, I was planning on working that under and uh, seeding a crop and do it again next year. So we, uh, it made great hay. There's two cuts there uh, that did uh, probably six ton per acre between the two of them kind of thing. And uh, yeah, very nice stuff. And my cows are still eating it uh bale grazing today so it's uh it was a good thing and yeah I, I think it worked out quite well and I ended up leaving that was a half section I had of that mix and I left a quarter of it to, to see if we can get a couple more years of hay production out of it because it, it looked pretty strong going into the fall. Scott that's something that that we try and do on our farm is use and, and I'll touch on it is use our relays to take a, a hay crop the following year and then usually just because I mean, two different systems, of course, you're, you're organic and, and we're still uh, addicted to glyphosate. Um, but yeah, we take like, we usually take a cut and then, and then try and get a short season crop in it, but maybe talk about hanging some of this, like these, <laughs> these low carbon uh, legumes, you said you're bale grazing. So you're putting it up for dry hay. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, it was definitely <laughs> making hay this is the first year I've ever made hay and I've listened to the guys. Are complain you about it. It again? <laughs> yeah. I've oh, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a challenge, especially like cutting in August, it was September by the time it was getting dry. So I flipped that stuff three or four times and uh yeah i i raked it all together once and then i think i flipped it twice after before i finally got it in the bale um yeah that can be an issue with uh with with those legumes for sure yeah. scott that was an excellent job you're gonna stick around for uh question time you much might. appreciate excellent presentation next we're very very lucky to have agriculture now's top runway model kevin nickel <laughs> Looking sharp. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, this is, it's always funny because when you and I get talking, uh, it usually goes on for an hour or two. So we got to try and keep it under 20 minutes. So let's, uh, let's see if we can do it. Right. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> Take a minute, tell us about yourself. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. You gotcha. Ke how's, how's my delay, Kevin, just before? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. I got a little more confidence to ask, ask questions now then. Okay, so um, we farm uh, near Rosenfeld, which is near Altona, right where you turn to, to go to Bungie off of Highway 14, for those of you who've done that. Um, we are not organic farmers. We, uh, we're strictly grain. Um, there's not much for cattle in the area, so uh, we've been paying attention to the soil health regenerative ag movement for some time, but we tend to focus on the first four uh, concepts. So we're trying to reduce our tillage and we're trying to keep up living root in the ground and we're growing cover crops. And, um, but yeah, not so much with the cattle. So um, relay cropping has been something that's um, really interested me. 
And uh, unlike Scott, we, we have not yet really succeeded at it, but maybe we've learned a couple of lessons. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I, you know, we're constantly looking for a system that's going to work for the whole farm that we can kind of get, you know, some, some kind of rotation with everything going. We've increased our, our number of crops that we've been growing lately, but um, uh, this is a picture of wheat stubble. So this has kind of been, you know, a goal of ours in the last few years is to try to get cover crop seeded onto every cereal, uh, canola, pea, acre, if conditions and the calendar will allow. So this is a picture from 2019. And this is a, a cover crop of uh, oats and canary seed and flax. And so in 2019, we were able to harvest our uh, wheat in the middle of August and uh, seed by the 20th and this is what we've got a month later and we actually had a considerable bit more growth by the time freeze up came to the point of actually being a concern um, we seed with a whole type uh, opener seeder and i was a little stressed as to whether all this material was going to flow through the the seeder was it going to dry and um, all of that uh, and it did thankfully uh, but um, you know, if we can pull this off um, in a in a cereal crop, we're not really looking to fix nitrogen. Um, you know, I would be happy with this. Uh, this Kevin, year, I gotta, I, Kevin, I got to interrupt you. Half the guys on the chat left because they're out booking annual fall seeded cover crop seed with this picture. <laughs> but you got to you got to give a caveat to what is the issue with this as well if you get the wrong year. Of course, yeah. Like uh, this, this does not always work. So that's that. That sometimes it's too dry. It's too late. And like this year, we didn't get this kind of growth. Although we got we got some decent growth, but we didn't get a chance to to do anything on our canola ground because we're doing pod shatter canola now. Our canola harvest is later than it used to be, and um, it just didn't it just didn't pay to do it. So if you go to the next slide, so this was. This was canola ground in 2019, and there too we were able to harvest canola in August and get out there and put this pea oat uh, cover crop on uh, by the 30th of August, and I think we're around the end of September here. And so, like that's that's decent. I was happy with with that growth, but you know the we've got peas in there. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're really not fixing any appreciable amount of nitrogen for the next cereal crop that we want to put there. So this is the place where I really think uh, a relay crop would shine is if we could have something growing in canola that uh, could fix nitrogen for us through the fall period after that canola was off. So if you go and to the next Kevin, just, just to touch on your point, just to touch on your point here, like, I mean, I, if anyone's ever listened to this to this webinar or ever met me, they know I believe in cover crops, and and my my ultra focus is to, to create a system where where cover crops are implemented, and I have sown uh, fall seeded annuals uh, probably for a decade now, and I've grown more vegetation than you have here one time. Yeah. It just seems like our, our harvests are later. And if it's if we get lots of moisture, the damn sun won't shine or the sun will shine. But we haven't had, had rain in a month and a half. So right. to, to, and, and I'm going to touch on it, too. But but to touch on your point about where you see relays being benefits, I see huge potential of if we can get a crop established and overwintered, there's a huge gap in the springtime where we have ample moisture ample sunlight growing days, much, much more predictable and reliable than we have in the fall. So if, if we, and, and like you said about the nitrogen, if we're putting clover into wheat stubble, we can get significant amounts of growth in the, you know, the middle of April to end of April to, if you take it to the middle of May, definitely enough, significant enough to, you know, to, to start cutting back on nitrogen rates. So, sorry, right. I, I, just to build on your point. Right. Yeah, no problem. So go to the next slide. So uh, like Scott, we we wanted to get clover going. Um, so we thought, well, let's this this is just a, a file folder. This isn't this isn't actually a seeding, but um, we tried in 2016 to to air seed 
clover into canola that was just coming off of bloom. And uh, you, as you may recall, 2016 was very wet. So this clover got all kinds of rain and whatever. Uh, but when harvest time came, there was no clover to be seen anywhere. So we think it was probably just too dark in there. So then in 2018, we tried that again, only this time we tried to do it uh, right after we sprayed Liberty and prior to bolting and we got some rain and then uh, some canola actually, or uh, the clover actually came up, but uh, then it didn't take very long and the tap got turned off. And although the canola continued to grow and do fine, it was well rooted and well established. The clover just shriveled and died. So again, there was nothing left by the time harvest came around. So, you know, getting airplanes and, and whatever, like it's not cheap. And when you get burnt a couple of times, then uh, you tend to get a little gun shy with these things. So um, um, after, after that, I think we left it alone a little bit, but then we thought, okay, well, let's try, let's try getting some clover established with wheat. So we put some down the seed tube uh, the following year with the wheat and we actually and this is again a file photo um, ours would have been in the in the seed roll and also I'm sure this is like a winter wheat situation or fall rye so we had clover coming up like not too far behind the wheat emergence um, however part of the uh, thing about conventional farming is that you want to spray weeds eh? so uh I, I had done a little research and in Ontario, it seemed like maybe they were getting away with spraying clover with buckthorn. Uh, so we tried that and um, the clover didn't die, but it definitely got hurt. And again, it turned dry. And by the time harvest came, no clover to be found. So- um, Kevin, sorry, sorry if I missed it. Did you, you put the clover down the same shoot as the, as the wheat or yes. like you sprinkled it in after, yeah. Yeah, and it 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 like it came up from an inch deep, which was kind of surprising. But was um, there any like was it a special variety that that you were growing to that yeah. was resistant to buck buckthorn? You know, we did an actual uh, we did some strip trials where we tried uh, subterranean um, uh, yellow single cut red and um, uh, blasna or whatever it's called. Um, anyway. I think the yellow probably tolerated the buckthorn the best, but in the end, they all withered and died. So um, I think I think maybe if it wouldn't have gotten sprayed, like maybe it would have continued to root better and it could have handled that dry period. Although I'm I'm not sure, but uh, I because other people have success with it like that, I'm, I'm I have to think maybe that's our problem. Um, right. So now, Kevin, just, you've touched on a neat trial um, with the, sorry, I forget the three clovers you, you, you tried, you trialed with the, with the herbicide. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I forget. I'm forgetting the varieties. Sweet. Yeah. So, so there was yellow, there was single cut red, there was subterranean and there was, uh, there was a fourth one that I, is, just escapes me now. Yeah, I think the Lance uh, and and the strategy was you went full rate buckthorn. Sorry, I'm I'm I, our conversation on the phone the other day. I know you were we had a conversation about um, playing with different rates of broadleaf herbicide, and and I couldn't remember. Are you using? Did you try full rate buckthorn or was that even at a suppressed rate? No, that was damage? that was full rate buckthorn. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's any potential in two thirds rate? Well, I guess it just depends on what else you have to deal with in the field and whether you, you know, I mean, buckthorns, it's not my favorite chemical <laughs> to begin with, with the kind of weed spectrum we have. So um, even at full rate, we had some other weed escapes. So, uh, but I, I, I thought that kind of based on, you know, what our choices were, that was probably our safest bet. But um, anyway, I maybe... I, I got I, I to gotta have a shout out to a, a popular panelist we had on a few weeks ago. I was sitting down with Nick Cowan, this is a, a few years back, and, and we were having a few drinks, or I forget if we were talking on the phone or whatever, but talking about different intercrop ideas, and Nick was saying, oh, and what are you going to spray on that? And I said, oh, it looks like it's going to have to be Odyssey, and uh, told him about another intercrop, and Nick says, what are you going to spray on that? And I said, oh, it looks like Odyssey. 
And Nick says, no, 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 no. This sounds like a good plan. Just one problem. Odyssey doesn't work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, should, we can have, we can talk about herbicide options, but also they might just be expensive water. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, um, Lastly, uh, this is this is the one relay crop that we have tried that has worked, although it was only by accident. <clears throat> so we've had a couple of situations in both uh, wheat and peas where we've put five pounds of flax with our wheat or pea crop. Um, so I'll talk about the peas. This the reason we did this was because Every other time we've tried growing peas, they've always been flat on the ground. And I heard, had heard a story of a guy from North Dakota who had put some flax with his peas just to act as scaffolding because he was having the same problem. So I thought, well, let's, uh, let's give it a go on one round with the cedar. So um, we, we put five pounds of flax with the peas and uh, all of the pea herbicides were, were nicely tolerated by the flax. Uh, this field has authority and then I think we, we use Bassagran and a grass killer and so that was all fine. Flax was happy as it could be and um, the flax came up with the peas and by the time we combined uh, we actually regloned the field because the peas were a little uneven so the flax got got smoked with the peas, harvested and then um, didn't, didn't have any issue with the flax, didn't see flax bulls in the hopper uh, yield was unaffected, I think. We didn't do a, a trial, but just based on the yield monitor, everything seemed like just very stable. But then um, all of a sudden we noticed that this flax, uh, all these stems started coming back to life. And uh, we, by this is probably the end of September. And, you know, by the end of, by freeze up, some of this flax was ready to bloom. And, uh, <laughs> The same thing actually happened in a wheat uh, experiment. We did uh, five pounds of flax with wheat there to, you know, maybe get some mycorrhizal benefits, some diversity, synergy going, whatever. Uh, sprayed with buckteral, and of course, flax didn't mind that. And uh, same thing, the the uh, we we cut, we were able to combine the wheat straight. The green flax didn't bother us. It went out the back. We had no intentions of trying to separate any flax seed out. And then the the green flax stems uh, started growing again, and and actually that picture with the dogs earlier that was that field, and um, the flax just grew up with the cover crop that we seeded later, and that was actually our and it was completely unscientific and not way wagoned either, but it was our best wheat field, so that was just kind of an interesting thing about flax. For anybody out there that. Uh... Your only memory with flax is uh, weeds and and no uh, grain in the hopper. Uh, there has been some very very interesting research on flax. Uh, you know, even in the last five years, it is the most mycorrhizal dependent plant on on the planet, or that grows in these conditions. It's the closest thing to a mushroom that we have. So, just to quickly touch on the mycorrhizal fungi network. It's a, a fungal network that connects with plants and gives plants the ability to share and transfer minerals. It's a communication network and flax is the most dependent on that network. So there's lots of arguments and starting to be some real research come out where flax is so dependent on other species and different rooting systems connected by this mycorrhizal fungi that it actually can boost you know, plant immunity and yield and mineralization. Um, there's yeah, lots and lots of good research about sowing flax with all mycorrhizal dependent crops and just spraying them out at herbicide time just to get that benefit to the mycorrhizal network. So uh, I would say you're definitely on to something, Kevin, and, and it sure, it makes the future exciting for sure. Right. So the one thing that uh, I'm really excited to try this year is uh, an idea I got from Alex Borsch on this very program a couple of weeks ago, and that is uh, alfalfa with Clearfield canola. And uh, I know you've you've maybe warned me about that. Might not be the might not be the best idea, but um, apparently you can spray Odyssey on it. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Other than the Odyssey, just very drastically right. herbicide and move on with your life. Anyway, the 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 dream the dream is to put uh, put some alfalfa uh, down uh, with the canola, have it grow up together, harvest the canola straight, let the let the alfalfa finish out the year, and the following year, uh, hurt it, hurt the alfalfa with some broadleaf chemical to suppress it and seed wheat, and then have that happen again, and then maybe terminate it at the end of the second year and hopefully get some, not only nitrogen benefit, but also some deep rooting. Like maybe this is a way we can actually work a perennial into our system and get some of those deep root benefits without actually making bales. Because yeah, I, I don't have cows and I don't really, like really want to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. For anyone else that picked up on this program, uh, the the pea intercrop or the canola intercrop, if you're thinking peola anyway, alfalfa or clover underneath, it's a really great option. Um, the crop's usually off in decent enough time to get some good regrowth. And if you got cows, or if you, you're just a well thought out guy like Kevin, to start cycling some of that carbon, mineralizing the stubble and the roots that are in your soil, it's a, it's a, it's a really good idea and you still have all your herbicide options. So Kevin, great job. Stick around for questions. We got lots rolling in. I'm going to buzz through this uh, relatively quick. This is a picture of me just proving I do other things other than uh, stand in fields and talk about plants. So looking forward to baseball and, and green grass, leaves on the trees. I cannot wait. But I just want to touch on, I, I'm going to touch on, I guess, a few specific relay crops, but I really just want to uh, for farms to understand the expectations. A relay crop, we are offering almost no sunlight to, we're offering almost no moisture to, you know, we don't want to affect our, our cash crop yield. Um, so we really have to understand that, that you know, we're not going to get a hay crop off uh, after, after an oat crop just because we have clover un underneath. I would say these two pictures are, are pretty accurate representations of in our relay systems, what we see after a, a cash harvest crop. So uh, on the left is clover, on the right is a clover alfalfa blend. And again, uh, this is not, it's photosynthesizing, it's doing its thing, which is fine. We're, you know, diversity doesn't really matter at this stage because there's just so little uh, energy being transferred into the soil. Really why we do it is for, for this aspect where in the, in the spring, when we're, almost guaranteed moisture. I know it's dry conditions right now and not a lot of snowfall, but we start getting nice spring rains or maybe we're even too wet. We can start uh, utilizing some of that moisture, some of that wasted sunlight to build soil structure, start balancing that carbon and nitrogen in the soil. And it, it really does, it makes beautiful seed conditions. And in this instance, we're going back in with a cereal. So we terminated with glyphosate and any clover or alfalfa was in this blend. Uh, anything that wasn't terminated by the glyphosate, we were able to, to get with a broadleaf herbicide pass. So on the right year, it is an excellent option where we have lots of moist, excess moisture. It, it uh, yeah, it's just, look how much biomass is being consumed, low carbon, high, high nitrogen. I actually, I'm, I'm, I think this was millet that we sowed here and we used no nitrogen fertilizer at all because, you know, this was going to mineralize so quickly, so low carbon, and just be returned back into the system. So I, I, I think, I guess I'm the only one that's talking about seeding in the fields. This looks pretty crazy when the neighbors drive by, but we did a trial with a hoe drill and a disc drill. This is oats we sowed fall rye and vetch into. And uh, the disc drill, actually, it's a, this was seeded way too late. You can see the canopy's basically closed in at this point. The disc drill, uh, had really good seed to soil contact germinated right away. It came up good and the hoe drill, I basically just blew it on and there was basically no germination. But just to, the picture on the right, just to speak on, on the difference sunlight makes. So this was, a, I had a plug run when I was seeding the oats and then this, the disc went in and sowed this row. We can get decent enough growth in a relay system if we're willing that trade off to uh, give our cash crop less sunlight and so actually some energy towards the relay crop and I'm going to talk more about the opportunity of it in the uh, in a couple slides from now. 
So this was another one we did oats and vetch down the same tube. I was telling Scott before the uh, before we came on, uh, it's nice with with oats and mixing these relay crops in. If it turns into you know a weedy mess or what this oats vetch looks like, you just take it as green feed and say uh, tell all the neighbors that oh yeah it was green feed all the time. Balance C to N yada yada. Um, so this oats vetch we had a, a wet fall and the vetch kind of took over. This is one of the failures i guess you could say but as you see on the right that's the the straw that came out of the back of the combine it feed tested fantastic and we got two bales an acre of uh high high quality feed out of our um you know straw wasted wasted byproduct and then this is i i know i you guys listen to me talk about corn vetch lots but it's just a nice example of of manipulating sunlight so maybe we're not ultra focused 100% of the sunlight being focused on our cash crop. So what, what if, I know this most farms heads explode when I say this, but what if we backed off uh, our yield or we're okay with 10% less yield to offer sunlight to a relay crop? What does that offer as far as if you have cattle grazing, uh, soil improvements, night, uh, biological stimulation, balance of C to N, like, for example, in this 60 inch corn, uh, there's enough residual end from the, the hairy vetch cover crop or relay crop that there's, there's no nitrogen need next year. So I guess my hope for the future, and we're definitely gonna test this is, can we, can we offer up a little bit of sunlight to that relay? And maybe the trade-off isn't one for one, but it's that little bit of sunlight allows a relay to get established, have sunlight corridors, and turn into something like what you see Rusty sitting in, which is a balanced living root in the soil, plant diversity, cattle feed, fertilized soil for next year. So the, so the benefits, yes, if we give up 10% of yield, that hurts, but to give up for benefits like this, I would say is a, is a, is a fair trade-off. And I touch on this every week, but doing something like this, High carbon corn, so you see, uh, well, it would be, well, corn stover 57 to one and hairy veg cover crop, so 11 to one. So all we're doing is balancing that seed end, balancing the energy sources for the soil biology, for the soil to create stable soil aggregates and, and really make that a functional soil. And we can prove it. The best water infiltration rates we see are in high carbon cereals. So I don't care if that's wheat or oats or corn or barley, you name it, millet, but underseeded with, with a uh, legume, the following year, that vegetative legume and that high carbon residue breaks down and we see the, the best water infiltrations on the farm. And, and that's just because we've, we've offered that biology, uh, a, you know, a living root, a high protein feed source, but also ample, ample amounts of, of carbon to create those stable soil aggregates and feed the soil biology. So, I, I don't want people to be too negative on it. I know we touched lots about the, the, the areas where it won't work and we have to limit expectations, yada, yada, yada. But it really is a good, a good practice if it's, a, if it's a first step or you've gone fall seeded and it hasn't really worked. It's a, it's a, it's a very nice, natu nice natural step two. And there's getting to be enough farms that are doing it like these guys were lucky enough to have on that are starting to see, you know, what they did wrong or, or <laughs> they made the mistake so you didn't have to. So if you're thinking about it, you know, ask a question. This is a nice segue. We'll get to the, the Q and A session. Um, so put a question in, ask these guys, right? They, they're pretty open and honest about it. Um, maybe I'll, I'll get it started just while Trav's gonna pass the, the computer over to me, but um, Scott, you start and then, and then you, Kevin, but uh, Kevin, you touched on it a bit, but I, you, I'm sure you got lots more to say. What's uh, the relay crop you've tried, you've had the best success with and are gonna implement you know, into the future or, if, or how you'll tinker with it? Scott, yeah. you go ahead first. Is that me or Kevin? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry, um, uh, Scott, you first. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think to me, Clover is a, is a really good fit. Um, I guess just one or a, a few thoughts of uh, Kevin's show there. Uh, in all the reading I've done, um, it seems like red clover is more able to survive 
in a low moisture condition in underneath the canopy than uh, alfalfa and some of the others is. So I think alfalfa is great if you can get it to grow excellent, but um, I wonder if throwing in a pound or two of red clover in that scenario is, is a good thing for you, Kevin, uh, and anybody else that's listening. Um, but so for me, uh, the one that I'm thinking next year is uh, I've got some peas and oats going in again. Uh, there seems to be pretty good market demand for organic in both of those crops. And so they're filling a little bigger spot in the rotation than I'm used to. And so to try and get away from some of the issues with growing peas too often, um, I think that's a good spot for a, a bit of a mix and we're gonna try some red clover uh, I'm, I think we're going to stick to a uh, single cut variety and we're going to put in some uh, uh, ryegrass with it. I'm thinking uh, Italian ryegrass that won't go to seed in the first year is uh, kind of going to be the new thing for me and just something to get some little extra carbon, mop up some of that uh, nitrogen that gets left behind. So that's, that's the next one for me to look at. Well, Kevin, just before you, you start, um, we asked Chris Ropers. He was a panelist a little ways back. He, he was on the call tonight, and Chris has done lots of relay cropping himself. Um, Chris, so yeah, if you want to just, I, I know if people were wondering uh, why there was a fourth name up. Uh, but Kevin, you go ahead, and then Chris, I know you got, you got lots to say, man. And then, uh, yeah, we got quite a few questions to get to as well here, guys. So uh, have at her, Kevin. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, we've got a field of fall rye out there currently, and I'm assuming it uh, uh, survives the winter and wakes up now in spring. I, maybe we should try this red clover idea again, and maybe we should should get the harrow out there and, uh, you know, scratch it a little bit. And, um, and yeah, with our alfalfa project, maybe we should throw some clover in. I don't know, can you spray clover with Odyssey? You can spray everything with Odyssey. That's because work. it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, okay, just to touch on that point, one of the questions in, uh, and, and I can answer it too, Kevin, you were just talking about it, and Trav and I were literally talking about this today, is what about frost seeding clover into rye? I was thinking about doing it with hairy vetch, but I, I was uh, we wondering out loud about red clover as well. So, uh, yeah, if... if, uh, if Somebody's tried, go ahead, if you guys have thought about it, but Chris, we'll start with you. We'll go in reverse order, then Kevin, then Scott. Okay, I'm sorry. Please repeat the question once. This is your yeah, first is question. It, how, is it, how is my internet? Is it not good? It's good. <laughs> okay, um, just talking about frost seeding clover or frost seeding vetch into fall rye or trying to get it established early and then going and seeding an, an annual cereal into it? I uh, don't have experience with that. Uh, so I can't speak to that one directly. I basically, what I've tried here is just uh, heavy Harrow Valmar, uh, either just red or a mix of clovers into my cereal crops. So that's uh, right around herbicide timing, either a day before, a couple of days before, or a couple of days right after. And those, the heavy arrows are literally just tickling it in. So we eliminate all, uh, uh, you know, concerns about herbicides and whatnot. And um, have seen some, Decent success with that. Uh, done it for a few years now. Definitely going to continue to try and do it. Um, one thing I'd like to, sorry, wearing off your question here, but one thing. Oh, good, I, man. You know, that, you know that's cool with me. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I'd like to try this year, maybe, uh, and, and Joe and the boys helped with that idea the other day is... Um, in a pea, for example, pea camelina intercrop, uh, uh, go with some perennial ryegrass at seeding time. I know Alex is doing that and, and so are quite a few other guys in, in whatever the crop might be. But basically my 
uh, criteria was uh, I want would like a third uh, crop in there, not for harvest, but for uh, extra uh, diversity and especially one that can be mycorrhizal dependent and uh, something that's green immediately after harvest so I can save the, the step of, uh, of seeding after harvest and those sorts of things. So uh, we'll play with that one this year. Also the uh, flax idea really intrigues me. Uh, some Kevin spoke on it a little bit earlier and um, yeah, that's it. I think uh, you touched on a good point. We didn't a benefit of relay cropping, Chris, which is uh, seeding a crop right after the combine is a fantastic idea in principle. Until you have four grain trucks to unload the combine to grease, you're running to Clarny for parts. And then it's like, oh, is anyone going to run the drill when we're already short men? <laughs> yep, exactly. So, Kevin, I know you touched on the fall ride, the frost seeding. Scott, you ever tried frost seeding anything? Yeah, I drilled in some uh, crimson clover one year into some, I think it was winter wheat actually. Uh, it germinated, came out of the ground, cod leadens, and then it froze as hard as a rock and died. And uh, that was that was my last experience. I, I don't want to dissuade anyone from trying it because I think it's a great idea. But, uh, I haven't had any luck with it myself, so I'm not sure. I, I... As a as a per, uh, perennial failure of growing hairy vetch, I find like my hairy vetch is growing in the spring and it comes up just beautiful. I got like a plant every six inches. I mean, like this is the year. And then it's just that vulnerable little plant gets a night at minus ten, and th she's not there anymore. So I I, I I think most of our or most of the damage that I've seen it, on this farm it actually happens in that frost and spring, just when those plants are really vulnerable so yeah i but i don't want to dissuade it of course if it doesn't work here there's people doing things everywhere that that don't work here so um so just to, so scott, oh sorry can i just you, jump in go ahead, go ahead go ahead kevin scott um so then would you would you kind of treat your seeding timing with the red clover uh, sort of like you would think about canola and then uh how many pounds do we actually need to seed of this stuff uh I've been, I'll, I'll do the easy one first. Um, I think like four to five pounds of clover seems to be all that I've ever needed and gotten pretty decent stands. Um, yeah, I, I think that's usually lots. Um, I don't think I'd go less than three, but yeah, somewhere in that kind of range is, it seems to be about right. Um, I think it, it also, Scott, depends. We did like, we, uh, what was it, 2018, had some sweet clover in our full season cover crops that we grazed twice. So in fairness, it was allowed to get established. The canopy was taken. So it, it was able to get sun like two different opportunities through the summer, but we had one pound and you it, the clover was so thick, you couldn't even walk through it. It was amazing. Okay. So like most things, when we talk about soil health or not, uh, you know, just straight conventional production methods. It depends on so many factors. Like, yeah. what are you going to do with it? No, and you're probably right. Like that, uh, that picture where the sweet clover got away from me, that was three pounds and it was like hair on a dog's back the next spring. So yeah, there's yeah. probably, I don't know. I, for me, uh, I'm counting on it in my organic system that I need the nitrogen. And so I probably, Air on the side of caution to some degree whereas yeah if i could buy some 46 i might uh be a little more likely to to skimp there but yeah for if i'm already making the pass whether and clover used to be cheap it's not anymore i just noticed the other day uh you should, you yeah, should start okay. a cover crop seed company that uses it <laughs> yeah <geez. laughs> uh, yeah so if it's three pounds or five pounds i always felt like oh, i didn't well, that wasn't a huge difference but by, by the time you were making the pass anyways but yeah uh, joe's probably right you could likely get away with a little less i always uh as far as timing goes into that fall cereal um like there were no leaves on the trees in that picture i guess i i'm big on biological indicators in terms of seeding timing and stuff like that uh but yeah, I think 
you don't want to, I wouldn't wait till I was seeing canola. Like it was, it was pretty early. I bet you it was the f not after the first week in May kind of thing. So it was, it was pretty early to do that job. Almost as soon as you can travel on that, on that winter cereal, you're not going to hurt it. And I'm lucky. So we got it. You, you got to, are we going to spread gotta, with fall rye? I, I think you can, uh, <laughs> fall rye is competitive. You just don't worry about that. I, I, I am lucky because I don't have to worry about thinking about chemicals. And so that does give me some flexibility that. Yeah. Like I would, I would, I would intend not to spray the fall rye anyway. I, but just when you said the clover froze off, I was just, uh, now I was wondering like, does that something that we need to worry about? Right. Yeah. No, that was, so that was in a frost seeding scenario, which was different than the, the herring it in one. Like that was uh, nothing growing yet, like nothing green in the field kind of thing. So it was probably in March, I would guess when I did that. Um, and yeah, I think for me, that was, it was just too early. Um, we got oh, got Guys, we got a question about uh, sewing with a disc drill. I'm, I'm wondering if I'm the only one that's done it, but Chris, maybe uh, have you ever tried relaying with the disc? And maybe if yes, tell us your seating rates. If no, talk about what you try and get on as far as seating rates uh, when you're broadcasting with the Valmar. I haven't uh, gone into an established crop with a disc drill. And honestly, I think that was one of the reasons why I bought one um, to, to try and do exactly that. But then when I think about the big tractor, the disc drill with all its wheels, and then a big cart following, I see, you know, potentially a fair few issues, not in a cereal crop, but in, for example, a canola crop or a pea crop or whatever, right? Anything that a heavy tire rolls over or a track rolls over and you, you crimp that stem, it's done. So that's where that kept me from. So with a Harrow, uh, much like Scott said in the three to five-ish pounds, uh, it was funny, the first year we did it, we dumped in some, val uh, some clover bags and didn't have the calibration right at all. And it kind of went on at like 20 to 30 pounds an acre. And you can still see that, you know, that first eight acres where those eggs that were supposed to do 50 acres on. And um, so that that clover seed is still uh, poach, uh, pump, pumping through there. But um, do any of you guys have experience with what a harrow will do obviously set very lightly into a, a, a growing canola crop. I've never tried that yet, but you know, same thing I'm imagining you'd go to uh, in the Liberty Link uh, crop, I'm used to uh, doing two herbicides. I would shorten that down to one, do it a little sooner. And then uh, right after that, basically go in with uh, whatever choice of seeds and just set it very lightly. Does anybody have experience with that? Chris, I like there, I've heard of a, a few people doing it, but I, I think it's more the seed selection than than just any seed. Like I think your chances of right because like canola seeds expensive unless they since I stopped growing it they started giving it away. No, no. <laughs> so it's like. I mean, you don't want to run the, the like, you, you want to have as many plants, right? Because it, it's really expensive seed. But something like if you could go in with a grass seed, like a perennial, like a perennial ryegrass, really any of the ryegrasses, like annual Italian or, or perennial, it's just they seem to establish better with less seed to soil contact, where you go in with a legume and it's a hard seed coat. And it's just like you need damp conditions for a long period of time. So you're talking then drop the drop the harrow and just broadcast it in. Yeah. And hope like hell for rain like the rest of us are doing. All right. Um, I I gotta I, I gotta tell you a funny story, and I'm not gonna say his name, but he's on, so he'll know who he'll know who I'm talking about. But I, I always see these grain farms that like right where max production and they all have really fancy disc drills or whatever drills and these things that we're rolling them out with, uh, you know, they're, they're outrageous price, half a million dollars, $750,000 for the, for these drills to get this 
precision drill and seeds down perfect and and it's going to shoot out of the ground and everything's going to be fantastic and then they're like i spread my cover crop seed on with an airplane and i can't figure out why it didn't grow <laughs> so it's like it really is like what type of conditions are you are you you know uh willing to put that seed through like it's just it's man i harp on this a lot but sunlight and moisture if it's getting if it's already compromised well we're north of the 49th parallel and they're already the two limiting factors by far so for compromising that even more like we gotta we, we gotta be thoughtful in order to have a better chance of success and even then you can totally screw it up for sure i was uh, at a <clears throat> field day once in the prairies here, I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to mention his name or not, but a guy that, that started doing all these things probably well before any of us did. And he was standing in the field with a bunch of us surrounding him and talking about all his different experiences and so on. And he said, you know, somebody brought it up, broadcast or arrow or disc drill or whatever, relay crop. And he says, I've broadcasted on enough different seeds over the years to take us all on a very nice vacation to Vegas. <laughs> and what I've learned out of the whole experience is to get it in the ground. You know, whether That's it's fun. just a light covering with soil and even residue or, you know, a proper expensive disc drill job or whatever, but get it in basically. So that's where I sort of jumped to that hero idea. And, but anyway. Well, and I think zero tillers, God love them. Like they're, they're already thinking more of this direction where I'm zero tilling any, anyway, how do I incorporate cover crops? But it's just like, if we're putting seeds on residue, they ain't gonna germinate. We need to get at least some seed to soil contact. Um, let's get, we'll keep rolling with the questions, you guys. Maybe we'll start with Scott and then Kevin and then Chris will come back to you. Talk about how you pick your seeding depth when you're, you know, uh, sowing a relay. Is it two passes? Do you kick one out the side? Mid-row bander? What's kind of the strategy to, to hit the ideal seed depth? Uh, I've done both. I think scratching them in with a mid-row bander is a pretty nice option if you've got the, the ability to do so. Um, and then, yeah, you can kind of really keep them in tight. But uh, like Kevin said, I've, I've had good success in planting stuff down the same tube as your cereal at an inch deep. And it, you think it's way too deep. And somehow I, I think it, there's something that goes on between the two of them, either the wheat pushes through and, and it blazes a trail or, or how that works. I don't know, but it has worked fairly well for me in situations where you think it's just, it's going in way too deep and lo and behold, it all appears later on. So I think there's some forgiveness there. Kevin? Yeah, I, you know, I, well, I talked about how we, we obviously didn't have luck with the broadcasting and, and no incorporation. And mm -hmm. I would agree with Scott. And I know I said it before, and that was a, a situation of seeding in spring with a drill. Uh, but we've, this last year, we uh, seeded all our cover crops with our deep tiller. We put our air tank on the deep tiller which has an air kit on it and uh, of course we're just going shallow but still like you know probably seeding two inches deep canary seed and flax and oats and it comes up and uh it's just it's surprising so yeah i think scott's right there's something uh i don't know they seem to help each other yeah and so same I guess probably same answer as both of those guys. Um, just work with the tools that you have at hand. Uh, don't, especially if it's just a relay crop, cover crop, or I shouldn't say just a, but don't go spending a pile of money on, on shiny iron, you know, for something that doesn't give you an immediate actual cash crop return type idea so just start with that and see where it takes you spend the money on the seed rather than the iron i guess i and i would argue where it's like be honest with yourself about the conditions you're putting the seed in and if 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 we're going to grow this cash crop 
no matter what, we're going to maximize commodity yield on that crop. Use the KISS method with the relay where it's like, you don't need seven species because the plants are going to get, you know, this high, right? It's, it's, it's really about giving it the best chance of success and, and honest to God, control your costs because I, I would hate to put a percentage on, on, on when it's going to work because every year's uh, every year's different. But it's like there's gonna it's not going to work lots for sure. It's going to turn hot and dry or like Kevin said, we had rain but the, the canopy closed in. It's just like we're we're not giving it the most ideal conditions. So um, being realistic, being observant of what's worked and what hasn't, listening to guys like you guys talk about this stuff. Like this is all valuable information. It's a good idea. It's just, we need, <laughs> like, like you were saying, Chris, the guy, he could take us all to Vegas on what he spends. Uh, man, I could take you to Bahamas for what I've tried to spend on growing hairy vetch seed. Oh, <laughs> I only got to hit twice now. It used to be once. <laughs> um, I, I, got, I look forward to that, Joe. Do it. When I hit? Take us. Oh, it's going to be the best. Um, so we got a guy here who is growing oats, um, likes a herbicide pass, but it hasn't worked out going in after herbicide pass. I'll, I'll, I'll say the same thing. Oats are damn competitive and they will close up a canopy better than anything. Um, Kevin, you talked about Bacterial M, which I, I don't think you can see it on oats or spray on oats, but, uh, uh, Scott, I know this kind of put, puts you out of this one, but, but Chris or Kevin, any ideas as far as herbicide in oats or, or different strategies maybe outside of, uh, of uh, herbicide? So Sorry, he, he, he's, he's seeding oats into a different monocrop? I'm sorry, no. He, he wants to relay a, a, a clover or something, something into his oat crop. And he's wondering if he does it at seeding is there a herbicide option or better timing um, to incorporate it? Because he's tried after herbicide and it hasn't worked. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so herbicide options off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, but all I could say really is that the, um, uh, yeah, pick something very shade tolerant and, uh, low growing not too competitive and then like my only experience harrowing it in uh <clears throat> oats are so fast vigorously growing i don't think you're gonna hurt them even if you ruffle them up so to speak quite good with a harrow like in my instance doing us into wheat uh like five to seven days after we roll through with a heavy harrow you can't even see any marks anymore and I think it gets that bit of incorporation and that uh, that helps it out to helps this relay crop to grow so Kevin yeah I I I don't know I when I was investigating uh, what clover could tolerate like what they would do in Ontario um, I, I believe from bromoxynol was on the list and maybe MCPA. And I don't know if I did see buckdrill there. You can spray buckdrill on oats, but. Um, I'm getting, somebody met in the comments mentioned I can. So that's good. Yeah. We're all yeah. learning. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what, uh, what else to say about that. Organic. Scott, don't spray. <laughs> yeah. Scott, I feel bad. We got a bunch of conventional farms on tonight, so they want to ask these herbicide questions. So I got a I got a crazy idea. We'll take five minutes uh, non relay crop break. I like growing grasses, so annual ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, but there's virtually uh, no non resistant wild oat herbicide left, and it's a huge issue in in grasses. It would be the number one weed. I want to graze some cows on my annual ryegrass chew it down completely on about the 1st of June and then make it a, a race for who can capture the most sunlight first, the wild oats or the annual ryegrass? Am I crazy? I think it's a good fit here. I always think wild oats are a symptom of 
free nitrogen, right? And so if you can, if it's a little bit limited there, I think you can you can get away from wild oats to some degree. That's I, I'm still a conventional farmer that puts too much nitrogen down. Up oh, no, I'm trying to talk you out of that, <laughs> which I think is it may play into my success with these things. I think is I'm I'm always growing in a nitrogen limited environment, and so I don't have these huge thick crop canopies that I did ten years ago, and I, I think that helps some. Um, Oats, yeah, we keep talking about oats, and I, do, I see why there's the appeal there, but oats are a thirsty crop. Like, if you compare oat water use to what wheat will use, um, I, I think that uh, the limiting factor to being able to grow a relay or grow something underneath is more often moisture than it is sunlight, and uh because oats use a little more moisture there it's a it's a challenge no matter what you do i kind of think we've gone as low uh if we're trying to get a, a perennial established under oats i've seeded the oats at half to three quarters of a bushel and they're still uh if you don't get some moisture it, it's a challenge so yeah i don't know what the answer is there well my father is not excited about it <laughs> But I might try it on a little bit for sure. Um, okay, guys, we're, we're going to do one fun last question. I'm going to give away the hat away. Eric Smith, my business partner, Travis, who's sitting next to me, the hats have been more of a headache than, uh, than we anticipated. So I'm going to the city tomorrow. I'm going to drop you off a hat so Trav doesn't have to mail it. So thanks for the question. You're getting the hat this week. Uh, but final question, you guys, and maybe we'll go uh, – we'll uh, Scott, Kevin, Chris, just talk about a relay crop you got burning in the back of your brain from, from maybe an observation that you've had from something in the past or something you've learned this winter, something you want to try um, to walk us through the concept, why you think it'll work and, uh, and, and if you're going to implement it. That's a hard question for to be the first guy to answer. You want me to start? Yeah, absolutely I do. Okay, I well, I everyone uh, has heard me talk about like the, this opportunity with corn veg, the fact that we can integrate cattle on, into the into a system like that. It's just a, a massive. It, our risk is very, very, very low because uh, we don't really even need that much of a, a cash corn crop on wide spacing to to pay for our expenses, and then the gravy is the, the land benefits from it. So. Of course, we're a, a byproduct of our environments. You, you go walk into a cornfield and the, the height differential between the vetch and the corn is, is very prominent, right? But uh, what excites me is why aren't these principles we're putting in place with our cereals that only grow, you know, two or three feet tall. We can still spread out those rows, use the sunlight in a different way. So still get the benefit of the wide row. Each row is capturing more sunlight but have wasted sunlight corridors down to that um, relay crop underneath. We can, we can keep that seed and balanced all throughout the year, um, not mimicking mother nature perfectly, but getting a hell of a lot closer than high carbon monocrop, low carbon monocrop, and those crazy cycles that, that come with. So what I'm excited about is, is starting to screw around with, with row spacing on our, our cereals too. So we've got two drills now we can go 10 inch, 20 inch or seven and a half, 15 and playing around with, with some of these legumes and, and, you know, really, really trying to leverage our grain land into, into cattle production and, and use our cattle to improve our grain land as well. So unfair because I knew I was going to ask the question and I knew I, what I was going to say, but anyway, <laughs> Scott, I'm going to kick it over to you now. <laughs> yeah. I think where I see the most potential is kind of a similar thing. Uh, I don't want to fool around with seeding equipment as much as Joe does, but uh, being able to get something growing that we can either graze in the fall, uh, we've kind of moved to half of the farm now, it was all fenced and uh, we can put the cows in there and use them, uh, which I think is a good tool in an organic system for sure. And I kind of, I think it's a good tool for everybody, but it's definitely easier to justify for me. 
Um, so yeah, growing something that we can graze in the fall or take an early graze or calve out on the following spring. Uh, and so that's, I guess, why I've been looking at that uh, ryegrass a little bit more. We haven't ever grown it at all, but I've, I've seen it a few times and it sure looks like it makes a lot of sense. So um, where we've got a little bit of nitrogen and uh, where we want to kind of soak that up, I think anywhere in that situation, we'll be trying to include some, uh, some ryegrass in the mix and throw the cows out on it later to, to make use of it. Great answer. Thank you. Kevin? <laughs> you know, it's so annoying that you cattle guys, you get, you know, you can, you, you can, oh, I, I'll try this or that. And if nothing else, the cows can just eat it. You know, like that's, that's hey, not even, hey, it's not even cattle fair. Cattle guys have been shit on in the egg industry for a hundred years. This is the chickens <laughs> coming over the roost. <laughs> and we're still broke. It's just like the retail guys kind of like us. <laughs> Yeah, so like I, I guess um, I don't know. I, I guess I already said the idea that I was excited about, and I'm. Well, another thing that's that I'm, I'm not so much. It, okay, one thing that I want to avoid is like some crazy mess that's going to cause me all kinds of headaches. So I, I, I want to, I want to do something where the odds of of uh, you know. I'm trying to create complexity, but I'm also want to maintain simplicity. And I don't want, I don't want things that I can't get rid of. I don't want things that I can't harvest. Um, so it's like, you know, what is, what is that thing? We got out of corn a few years ago and um, uh, you know, whatever it's, it has simplified our lifestyle a lot, but now with 60 inch corn and people doing all kinds of interesting stuff with that, I'm, I'm like, that looks really interesting. I don't know if we're going to do it. Like I could get the neighbors to, you know, plant some corn and I could fiddle with that. And, and you were talking about the sunflower thing the other day and, right. you know, I don't really want to combine sunflowers in the snow, but you know, maybe we should, I don't know. So there's all kinds of, I love, I love thinking about this. I'm just not right now. I'm thinking about alfalfa and canola, but uh, I'm always, you know, looking for other stuff. Who knew, just to touch on your point, Kevin, I did not understand that when I went down the regenerative egg path, that in December, I'd be starting the combine more than the front end loader. <laughs> <laughs> it was a boring concept. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, so um, we're up here on the hill, right? A uh, lot shorter growing season than you guys and uh, corn and things, unless we are able to uh, uh, get livestock out there during the winter. Um, for uh, grain harvest, it doesn't interest me at all. Same with sunnies. Uh, so one thing I've just recently listening to um, anybody that's got some time for YouTube, go to uh, Joel Williams on Porsche Live. It's one I listened to on the weekend and was very, very interesting. Uh, lots of actual factual data and that one uh, from across the globe with real farm studies involved. But anyway, um, it just sort of, uh, just yeah. Just to touch on your point, Chris, I, I what, you sent me the link and I watched it. It was fantastic. I texted Joel, told him, and that guy is a world-class presenter. Yeah. Fantastic how he... he uh, presents some very complicated data in a way you can understand. Yeah, for sure. So um, to your question, I, uh, I'm, I would like to try wheat uh, and a legume, and I'm currently thinking uh, fava bean this year. And um, I would like to get a third species in there. So we got cereal legume. And so I've been thinking uh, broadleaf, uh, like, like flax for the fact that it's so mycorrhizal dependent. Now, at what timing do you put it in? I've been wondering about, um, you know, this would make it triple intercrop, but uh, at seeding time. So find a, a, a herbicide to do that either has a little bit of residual. I know heat is out, heat and, and flax are a no-go, um, but 
I, I haven't researched enough yet if there's anything else that has a bit of residual or else just go for it, get a, get a decent burn off, put the three in together or option B, um, uh, again, Harrow bar go out after. I know Alex tried wheat flax. He's very fond of it. He tried it in the organic. He said he was talking to another fellow who tried it in conventional. He was very happy with it. But then uh, another option could be the uh, wheat, uh, faba bean, and um, some sort of a chenopod or a brassica in there, some sort of a radish or a beet or something like that. You know, I, I haven't had great experience with those. Also haven't done that too much because of the flea beetle issue. But I wonder, I wonder how, uh, you know, I think we've all probably heard some experiences by now that when those start growing in amongst a bunch of other plants, wind shaded and so on, that, uh, that sometimes it protects them. So, yeah, I don't know. Over the next few weeks here, I'll make my mind up. And I've, I have heard in the past that, that uh, uh, harrowing in flax does like it doesn't need a deep seeding depth right so yeah. it could be something that goes in after a couple to three weeks after the first two are established and gone um and uh, and again the harrow idea and then hopefully the flax I, you know hopefully it just stays low it doesn't end up with green flax poles in the in the hopper i'm not sure yet but uh, sorry to, to, to touch on the, uh, the flax idea. I know three of us have talked about it, man. Am I excited, uh, to, to start intercropping flax with just about everything. I'm not organic yet. Uh, or I don't know if, I don't know, uh, man, glyphosate's tougher to quit than smoking. And I struggle with both bad. <laughs> 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 so and, but anyway, I think it's just such an amazing idea to like stimulate that mycorrhizal network and even, you know, even in a crop like canola where it's like, is the possibility that club root is, is becoming such an issue? Is that because for 400 million years, planet Earth, uh, the land base was covered every millimeter with mycorrhizal fungi. And now it's just been the last 40 years that we've been taking these large sections of land growing monocrop brassicas and they don't exist. So like, is there, is, is there research on, on, you know, growing flax with canola to stimulate that mycorrhizal network to, to, to fend off club root? I bet the university is not going to research it because who's going to fund it? The flax council? <laughs> Surely they can't exist. <laughs> but anyway, just the, the idea of like adding crops uh, like we've been told forever, competition, competition, grow one crop, grow that crop. But it's just so exciting in the future. And like, it's, it's honestly, you guys, it's, it's not the universities. It's the Kevin Nichols and the Chris Ropers and, and, and Scott, I'm sure you've worked with lots of things we haven't even touched on other than flax. It's like, it's the research that you guys are doing and that we're doing here that we're going to find out these answers. So it's, it's, it's super exciting. And, and I didn't realize this was going to turn into a, 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 a flax relaying webinar, but I, I, I am the second thing I'm excited about is, is start intercropping as much mycorrhizal dependent crops as I can with, with flax. So guys, we, we've basically hit our time limit. Um, anybody have anything pressing to say? Words of wisdom or advice? No, thanks for putting it on again. All right, you guys were all awesome. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah, we'll see you guys again. Oh, oh, oh we got uh, Graham Sait Monday night. The the webinar is is Monday. Um, thanks a lot for being on, you guys. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Scott, Kevin, Chris, you guys were all awesome. We really appreciate it. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Joe. See everyone. Um,